morning from Miami Beach. This is Dr. John Bennett broadcasting um, Neurosurgical TV, another uh, episode of the current uh, Neurosurgical News. Board. Uh, we have the pleasure of having Saeed uh, in my uh, a master student from the Netherlands. He, uh, he's going to give a presentation on virtual reality and augmented reality in neurosurgery. First, let's meet the panel before we turn it over to Saeed. Hello, John, are you are you there? Still there, John? I guess John must have skipped away. Hello, Jason. Go ahead, Jason. Go ahead, Jason. Can we hear you? Go ahead. Hi, John. Nice to see you. Okay, could you could you identify where you work and stuff and what you do? Hi, John. So I currently work with a company, a startup that John O'Kello and I uh, created. It's called BioIntel Doc. Mm -hmm. And we focus in uh, building applications utilizing computer vision. And we are working towards identifying biomarkers in real time across non invasive sites. And we push out to extended reality interfaces. Very good. We'll hear, we'll hear more about that. Hello, John. Hi, I'm John O'Kello. Uh, just like uh, Jason just said, we work together and we have a, a, our startup, BioIntelDoc, uh, BioIntelDoc.com, that we are um, building together on mainly AI and as well as other biomarkers, okay. including, yeah, including genomics. Very good. Yeah. Okay, welcome. Okay, Marco, could you please introduce yourself? Of course. Uh, mm, uh, nice to meet you, everybody. My name is uh, Marco Meloni. I'm a consultant neurosurgeon uh, in Gravedona, North Italy. A frequent participant, too. And Tan May, are you, uh, can you hear me okay, Tan May? Hi. Go ahead, Tan May. Hi, John. Here, could you please introduce yourself and say hello? Hi, I'm Tan May from India. I'm final year neurosurgery PG. Okay, welcome, a neurosurgeon from India. Okay, Saeed, welcome, thank you for coming, and it's all yours. Hi, uh, yeah, my name is Saeed. I'm a master's student in uh, Maastricht University, and I study uh, medicine. At the moment, I'm doing my clinical internship to, in neurosurgery, and I also did a research internship along with uh, Dr. Kubben, who was also um, yeah, a neurosurgeon in Maastricht. And we were doing some research on augmented reality. And I have a presentation here that I would like to show. Okay. Oh, there yeah. you go. Perfect. Cool. So we were debating on a bunch of different topics, actually, for a research uh, internship. And one of my favorite things about uh, medicine is how you can incorporate different types of technology and how that can help or affect and maybe alter the way we do medicine in, yeah, in our regular way of, uh, of doing it. So... Neurosurgery is a specialism that usually that requires a lot and requires a lot of imaging, and usually that's in the form of CTs and MRIs. And over the years, there's been a lot of different types of viewing methods of MRIs and CTs, from you know watching it in 2D, using it on a screen, to making 3D models from these scans, either using yeah complex programs on the computer and then making them into models so that we can look more detailed into these into these scans. Um, now what I found interesting was the way we view these scans because we're still looking at a 3D model on on a screen which is still 2D and one of the methods that came about a long time ago was using stereoscopic uh, glasses who basically show us two images at the same time and the glasses would turn that into one three-dimensional image. Um, there were some applications of this in uh, medicine, but that required a, you know, a special screen or a special beamer, and then you'd have to wear the glasses. And it was a bit not practical because at the same time, we would have these scans, but you still need a mouse and keyboard or some sort of controller to control these scans. So in operations, this wasn't the best thing to use in our opinion. After that, there was a um, surge in virtual reality devices, especially since the 2000s. And, um, this was basically a device you wear on your face and then it would project the screen on, in front of your eyes. So the reality around you, your surroundings and environments, you wouldn't be able to see them anymore, but the device would project a completely virtual environment around you, 
which would be handy and for example you could play some objects in there or for games and th things like that you can really think of a lot of different applications for this but again in an operation itself it would be I think best that you can look at your own patients instead of looking at the screen in front of us. So this wasn't a very good idea either. So the idea of augmented reality came about pretty quickly after that. Uh, everybody knows what this is. No, uh, anybody? Those virtual reality glasses. <laughs> <laughs> no, these are some old toys. Um, from back when I was a kid, you could wear these and then you would put like this little disc inside of it. Oh, okay. And then you would turn this, this little, little lever thing and the disc would turn. So basically- Oh, right, right, like a kaleidoscope. Yeah, basically you could still see your surroundings, but yeah. this would project an image on your surroundings. That's okay. actually what augmented reality is. Nowadays, we use our phones most often and a lot of games are, using applications like augmented reality and i don't know if most of you know pokemon go but that's a pretty famous game since i think 2016 and you can play it without augmented reality but one of the most more fun aspects of the game is that you can see the the pokemon or the little creature you're trying to catch in your environments by using the camera and it would put the the object or the pokemon in this case inside of the inside of your surroundings and with new phones that are coming out there there are more specific um forms of uh surrounding or environmental detection um for example back in 2016 when the game just came out it would just basically be like these glasses where you would have the the image right there and when you turn around it would just stay in front of you but nowadays it would your phone would be able to scan the surroundings like this is a table this is a floor this is a wall and it would project the image onto it so that even when you're walking around, the image you would see would still be stuck on the outer world, so the real world object. Um, since then, actually, since about four years now, there's been a, high, like a lot of different types of smart devices coming out from smart watches to smartphones to smart uh, fridges even now. You even have um, microwaves that can tell you the, the calendar or go on the internet. And obviously there's been also a bunch of smart glasses that came out. And one of the ones that really spoke to us was one the one from Microsoft. Here we see four different other ones. These are all, well, other than the Fusix, these are all about $200 or less. So they're pretty budget friendly and uh, accessible to everybody. You can just buy them from Amazon. But what these would do was they would connect to your phone and then as you're walking around or doing your daily life, you can see notifications pop up in your, in your peripheral vision. And the HoloLens from Microsoft did this slightly differently. So instead of being connected to a phone or a laptop or something like that, it would have its own processor or chip inside of it. So you could just use the device as a standalone device on its own. And back when we, me and Peter, uh, Dr. Kubin, I mean, uh, did experiments on it was about two years ago when the HoloLens more or less came into into public hands as it were and uh, At that point there wasn't a lot of applications you could do There weren't that many apps going on and people developing apps and I myself. I'm just a medical student So I don't really know how to program or do any of these complex um, app designs so what we did was we wanted to do some research into what is the state of augmented reality hardware and software right now. And if that has a application in operative or possibly educational settings. And we wanted to see how fast medical students, residents and specialists can be like, okay, this is a new device. I want to see how, how to use it because we all know how to use a keyboard and mouse. I just wanted to see hmm, how fast is, can someone like a specialist or a medical student learn how to use a completely different a navigational system so checking the learning curve and we wanted to see how it would how it would work in an operative set, setting so we ended up going for the hololens which is a device from microsoft as i said we tested it on 27 people from the from our hospital using time tasks and questionnaires and from software point of view we used basically free software just to keep it as budget friendly as possible we use a 3d slicer and an autodesk converter we grab some CTs and we turn them into um, yeah, holograms, basically, using this converter. 
And then what you ended up were with these images that I have here. Um, maybe for next uh, seminar, I'll actually bring the device and maybe live stream it so you guys can see more or less what I see, which is because showing it like this is not doing the device very justice. But in any case, you can kind of see that I tried, you can make a device, a, a hologram from the scan. And here we see a CT from a skull that has been uh, operated using DBS. On the first image on the left, you can just see the skull floating in, in, in midair, as it were. And But as you move your head towards it, you can actually go inside of the skull and see how the leads go down inside of it, which is pretty pretty fun to do. And on the right, we also uh, that's basically how the, the software looks. So you can put programs and windows um, everywhere and just click on it with your hands. There is no mouse, no controller, no anything. You just use your hands to, to move everything. So we tested it out and we noticed that the device was actually fairly easy to learn, to use, and it was relatively comfortable to wear as well. The holograms were also clear, even with a lot of backlight in the back. We also used it in an operative setting. So we wore the, oper you know, the entire operational clothes, the scrubs and everything, and then put the device on and still were completely sterile. And then did a simulation of an operation, but you could still use the, the device fairly easy. It recognizes your hands and gloves and everything. Um, from the people we tested, we saw that only four of them had actually a yearly experience with VR and only one with AR, and that's mainly because the person plays Pokemon Go a lot. <laughs> and uh, the question for me was, which one would be more advantageous for, neur for neurosurgery in this case? And the, the biggest and strongest devices are either the VR or AR device, the one, the one we just tested, and we noticed that the VR device as well, being stronger and more having a stronger uh, processing ca uh, capacity, they are still needed to be connected to a computer. They, they, they still block off your complete vision so you can't really see anything. And they're not complete, yeah, they're not completely portable and wireless. What AR has over VR is that it's, you know, you can see your environment, so you have a lot of different ideas. You can think about that, for example, what I just said in the beginning where you can place um, a, a virtual, object and connect it to a real world object you can think about okay if i have an operation i can for example project a scan that i had earlier on top of the person i'm scanning say i'm doing a craniectomy i can um, put the scan of a ct scan on top of the skull as i'm operating so you can clearly see what you're doing in real time as well and um or other Applications would be like if you want to teach your patient like hey that you have this and this and this problem You could just give them the device and they can just look at themselves and be like, oh, that's how my nerves are trapped or this is how This operation went and you can clearly just educate them much more nicely using the glasses instead of using Black and white images from the MRI. You can just put the MRI images on the person and they can be like, oh I see <laughs> I can I can clearly visualize what you're going to do and you can explain the operations much more nicely other than that, the portability and the wirelessness of the device we found much handier than using um, virtual reality because you can literally just walk around the entire hospital wearing the thing. It just needs a Wi-Fi connection, so you can just connect it to your phone if, as well if you want. And um, the only problems we found was that because it's not connected to a computer and because it's um, fairly new, there was limited processing capacities, cap capabilities. For example, when we made the CT scan and turned that into a hologram, we had to lower the polygon count a little bit because or else you just couldn't see the, the, the hologram at all. It just wouldn't project it, it would be too much. And other than that, there was a limited supported apps. I had to go through about five different programs to be able to go from CT scan to hologram. And I know nowadays there's, there's a much more streamlined progr program that you can just put in the CT scan and it creates your hologram for you. But the, there is still some issues with doing this. You, you do need a little manual to know what to do, which is what we found a little annoying. Um, about three months ago, the new HoloLens 2 has been, was announced and I hadn't had a chance to put my hands on it yet. Apparently it's way stronger and instead of just using one hand to, to control the things in, the, in, in your reality, you can actually use two hands to move around things, which is pretty nice. It's also much faster, much more tactile to your fingers, so I would imagine in an operative setting this is much nicer than using the, the first HoloLens where we had issues where you would try to pick something up but it wouldn't recognize it, so you have to actually stand on a specific um position or else it would it just wouldn't recognize your, your your fingers this one seems to be much more faster in that sense and 
with a stronger processor comes the capabilities for stronger applications. So we do also hope that some designer, some app maker can help us make a much more nicer streamlined procedure of making CT scan or MRI to holograms. And from this presentation, I had a couple of discussion points, mainly the that, well, learning and using the HoloLens, HoloLens required actually minimal effort from both students and doctors. We did see a way faster um, learning curve from the students as they are much more used to uh, phones and new technology, I would assume, and then specialists would take about a little bit more, maybe five minutes to learn to use the device. But in any case, everybody learned to use the device in under 30 minutes, which is much nicer than some other devices that you could buy to see 3D scans that A, are much more expensive and B, require a lot more knowledge on how to use all of these programs and controls. The UI was very easy to navigate. It's just it's the same as a Windows computer. You have your Windows, you have your programs, you just turn it off and on, it's very easy. Um, even with backlight in the background. Uh, we also shown that if you play games with the device, it's actually much faster to learn to use the device. So that's a, a fun plus. And making the 3D models, as I said, from the scans was free. It didn't cost us a, a, a dime. And it was a quick process. It just required a lot of different applications and programs. So, Coming back to my point of, is this useful in any point in time for a nurse surgery? Well, in an operation room, I do see a lot of applications for this device. You can probably put it on and see, for example, you can put the stats of a patient that you don't really have time to look at, for example, allergies or, or other things that uh, the vital signs, you can just put it on the side of your peripheral vision. So as you're operating, you don't really have to look up where is the, where is the, where's the blood pressure again? And then it just, it's written right there. Um, or you can put the scan also in your peripheral vision. So there's a lot of applications you can do in the operation operative room itself, and not just for neurosurgery, but also for other forms of surgery. Specifically for neurosurgery, this will help a lot with preoperative planning. Um, if you have a scan and you want to devise a specific pathway to, I don't know, a tumor or a specific approach to your problem, you can use the device to actually just pre-plan your thing by actually making a model and moving it in real time in, in, in space instead of just looking at it on a computer screen. And for educational purposes, this is also very nice. For students, especially for me, I had the opportunity to learn a lot more from about neuroanatomy, which isn't the most easiest form of anatomy. But by wearing the glasses and actually grabbing a skull or a brain and making it much bigger than me and just walking around it, I could much nice and much easier see, oh, this is rich which region that synapse connects with that and I could just, I can learn much easier. So I do see a lot of usability and applications for this device in neurosurgery. And I hope that with this presentation, I can maybe show you guys that you guys can also think about that. What do you guys think? Well, great guy. I tell you, that's, uh, that was really good. There's, I'm sure a lot of discussion points raised in Jason. I think they're singing your song. I think stop <laughs> singing your song. Yeah, I'll, get you, I'll bump you off the screen share, okay? Uh, yeah. Uh, so I, and go ahead, Jason. Oh, excellent uh, presentation, Syed. Um, so I, I had a few questions uh, around your uh, testing with your sample size. You mentioned there were 27 end users that you tested the device with. How did you find the ergonomics of the device for the users and other factors, including how did the device fit? To the uh, to the head of all the users, and how was the durability of your device after the testing? We well, actually, very positive. We tested it on a couple of different factors. I didn't show you the questionnaire because it's in Dutch, but basically, we tested on were the holograms visible from zero to five. We tested if the hologram um, if the device is comfortable, zero to five, and we tested a bunch of different things about the device itself. And we noticed that we grabbed. Um, I just went around and asked a whole bunch of people with, with posters just for that. Will you join my <laughs> Will you join my research? So we had about around, if I recall correctly, around 18 students and um, nine or so residents and specialists, all with different head sizes, women and men, all different ages as well. And the device, uh, basically, it has, um, yeah, unfortunately, I don't have it with me right now, but it has a little bit of a band in the back, and you just turn this band, and it um, moves. Uh, in this position, left and right, and then when you put it on your face, you can actually just um, adjust it in a vertical axis as well on top of your nose. 
And for example, I have glasses. You can take the, the little nose thing from the, from the lens off and you can just wear the lens on top of your glasses as well. I found it very comfortable. I wore it for long periods of time as well. As I was doing my research, I would just put it on and then right on my computer and just look there. And then I have another screen with, I don't know, uh, some, some, some other stats there or some details there and I would have something else there. So as I'm working on my laptop, I had multiple screens open using the glasses and I just wore it for multiple hours. Uh, but that's me uh, around the other people that told me they all found it fairly so from a scale from zero uh, one to five with four be five being the most comfortable and one being the most uncomfortable thing you can wear most people said it was a four i only had one person that said it was a one because it didn't really fit his head very well but other than that i don't think there will be a big problem with this device fitting most heads especially with the new one coming out on um the hololens 2 i noticed that there were some changes in how it's done instead of a band it's more of a hat you put on with an adjustable strap around it. So I think that's a much better design. Have you used the uh, HoloLens too, Jason? Uh, yeah, so I've been developing on the HoloLens since uh, the early days, since it was announced back in March 2016. And um, one of the another developer and I in the mixed reality community joined forces and created a social holographic communications platform called Mix3D. And that's where end users, remote end users are connected. As we all are on this um, Zoom webinar uh, call this morning, we would all be walking around within each other's living space as tagged avatars to each camera device worn by each end user. So we've it's been in production since 2017 and available for download through the Windows Mix, uh, the Microsoft Store, and it's available for the Microsoft Hololens right now, as well as the other immersive mixed reality uh, devices. Um, Can you show us that, uh, Jason? Uh, yeah, I'll show you the Hololens. Do you mind, do you mind Say, do you want to see it? Yeah, I do. I haven't seen the second one yet. So. Yeah, okay. Oh, I, no, I, I, I knew you guys would get along. Yeah, I don't have the second uh, device yet. It's not pegged for release until June 2019. So you're um, actually working with Microsoft to develop it. Yeah, so through the other startup um, that I have, uh, we have a five-year partnership agreement with Microsoft, and we agreed to pivot towards the education technology sector. So this is what the HoloLens device uh, looks like here. This is version, I would say like version zero. It's the first developer's uh, edition that was released back in, yeah. March, 2016, they announced it at the uh, Microsoft Build Conference back in October, 2015. And that's around the time I was invited by Microsoft to test the device and then through my, through my use case that I submitted and my application, then I was accepted as a Wave 1 developer. And we've been um, actively developing in the community. Um, most of the apps, keep in mind right now, they're all in R&D. So a lot of the apps that are available through the Microsoft Store, they're from prototype stage all the way to full production kind of flagship apps that Microsoft has backed. OK, yeah. very good. Yeah, I've noticed that when I was, I think the one I have is the, the consumer one. So the slightly, it, it didn't have the, the strap above the head basically. Which oh is yeah, it's just a strap here. It's just um, an additional kind of strap that you can attach to the, to the top of the device. And then it just makes the device a little bit more stable. And I was asking about um, comfort levels of your users. Um, I found, yeah, for the most part, this seems to fit to most skulls, but I would say that there are some outliers where, um, yeah, especially like if it's uh, younger people, they're, then the device, they might be bouncing around and the device could fl fall off the head. Or if it's um, uh, people with uh, larger skull sizes, then they have a hard time actually getting the device on. So they have to kind of situate it a little bit more. One of the um, pr uh, new, features of the version two device that's being released is the ergonomic factor. And in fact, I believe this one's about one and a half pounds that's worn, but the new one is supposed to be 30% uh, uh, lighter and more comfortable. How they measure that, I'm not sure, but. Okay. Yeah, we did notice that I had, I think two or three um, smaller, younger um, student girls that would wear it and they would have their hair basically tied up in a ponytail. And wearing that device is a, is a bit of a little, is a bit of an 
a little sport to try to fix that entire device on your their small yeah smaller skull whilst having the hair somehow there and i did notice that wearing the device especially the front part is heavier than the rest of it if you don't put it on correctly you will get your glasses to press really hard and really down on your nose after a long period of time but i look i watched the uh, the what was it, the presentation of the hololens 2 that was shown i think three or two or three or four months ago and yeah it did seem much easier to wear much faster to wear the the lady that showed it just put it on quite easily and it was just moving around her head it didn't wiggle even though that one itself when it was when it is actually on your head it, it, it didn't seem unstable at all it was it's also a very sturdy device i didn't i wouldn't think that if it falls down once or twice that it would immediately shatter into a million pieces i do think it's a pretty sturdy device Okay. Yeah, absolutely. I have to agree with that. Um, yeah, the, and the nice thing about this technology is that it, uh, the applications can be pushed out through several endpoints. So you build kind of one project and then you can uh, port your code over quite easily to like virtual reality devices, to smartphones for augmented reality interfaces, or to the, even the head uh, mounted devices here, such, such as the mixed reality. I would say um, the competitor to the Microsoft HoloLens, the closest one would be Google Magic Leap. Um, but from the feedback within the development community, uh, Microsoft HoloLens is much further ahead. And especially you're building the applications for the universal Windows platform. So basically that same code base fits across the entire ecosystem of devices for Microsoft's products. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. I do have to say, though, that the devices are, in my opinion, a little bit different in, 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 in usage. For example, the Google Glass, I would rather connect it to my phone and use it more in a daily life kind of situation. As I'm walking around, I would like to see notifications pop up. I don't think I would wear the HoloLens to go around walking in the city, for example. Okay. It's a, a bit too expensive to do that and be, it would be a bit weird walking around with such a big device in my head. Well, Not that's why it was with Glass, too. Yeah, that's it. Well, yeah, but I like I did show some pictures just now. Some of the newer uh, augmented reality glasses just look like sunglasses. They just look like very fancy sunglasses. There's a battery here, the microphone is here, and some of the speakers are just um, temporal um, bone speakers, so you don't even have to put in headphones or anything. It just process, um, sends the sound waves through your skull, so you don't. Re it just looks like a sunglasses. Um, but on the other hand, the HoloLens is much more of a computer you're wearing on your face, basically. That's how I kind of see it, while the other one is a more of an extension of my phone. This is an actual um, computing device that I'm going to use to do some work, as it is. I would la rather have this thing, uh, have it up. I can open up emails, as it were. I can answer them using my voice commands. I can type. I did notice, on the other hand, that um, being from a Dutch uh, university, a lot of the people I was um, um, doing this experiment on were all either Dutch or some sort of European variant. And the Google um, does not respond very easily to a European accent as I've, as I've tested out as well. They don't respond to the American stuff. accents either. <laughs> <laughs> Well, don't worry about that. Up till now, I've been with my accent. I've been pretty, pretty successful with making Google do do, do things oh, I really? want. Oh, okay. You're lucky. <laughs> yeah. No, but um, even then, using the voice commands, as it were, I would just use it to be like, hey, um, hey, or and in this case, it wasn't Google. It would be Cortana. I'd be, hey, Cortana, open this app, or hey, Cortana, do this. But actually, using the device itself, I'd rather just use my hands. Mm -hmm. you, you know, you mentioned uh, you superimpositions of images onto a patient's skull, etc. Or one clinical use, as well as displaying data from the patient. Um, surgeon, I know that uh, we interviewed a spine surgeon from Brazil that uses it and super, superimposes exactly that. Um, is is there any other uses that you know of in the OR? Do you envision or actually have seen? Um, well, the the superimposing images onto onto the real world, which in theory sounds pretty easy, but you have to kind of think about okay, I, this is a hand, for example, and I would like to impose a, an X-ray of a hand on my hand. It would have to move as the real world hand moves, and it would have to also kind of bend just the same. And X-rays usually don't do that. So there's a lot of little bit, the idea behind it is relatively simple, but the execution of it, I would imagine, especially for programmers, because I would not want to be in the shoes of a programmer. 
to 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 execute this 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 application. But one other, well, for example, the showing the peripheral data of a patient while you're operating is always handy. Um, for a patient that's just laying still in an operation room, that's a bit easier. For example, if you're like what I said, yeah, if you're doing a if you're doing a DBS surgery, you can put the patient here, and then you can look through the glass. You can see, okay, this is where the skull is. This is where I'll do my entryway. Mm. That's much easier um, because the, the patient's head is not moving around. But what I also think is very important is that you can use these glasses also to educate students or patients much easier than showing it on a screen. So if you give the glasses to, I don't know, some a, a, a patient or like a kid or something like that, they would, first of all, be, whoa, taken aback by how cool it is. But then afterwards, they'll be like, oh, so this is what you're going to do. This, it, I think for explaining things to students or to patients, this, is, this, is, this would be a great help. Mm -hmm. Patient education, huh? Yeah, and, and students. To actually see the operation taped or whatever? For example. Yeah. Marco, any comments? Uh, uh, well, uh, is uh, definitely impressive, uh, uh, and uh, is uh, the um, the proof that neurosurgery go uh, at the same uh, walk of uh, uh, technology. Uh, I um, I appreciate a lot this technology, uh, even uh, for uh, above all for uh, education of. Uh, neurosurgeon for the patients and also for planning of surgery. Uh, the only uh, thing I guess it should be a problem using this technology is when you use the operating microscope. When you use operating microscope, uh, microscope uh, the, uh, it could be useful to have this hologram at the same loop of the microscope. For example, when you're performing scalp-based surgery to remove a uh, Clivus uh, two more. Uh, you could have the, uh, the this hologram. Theor theoretically, I'm not a technologician, so <laughs> I'm just talking as a neurosurgeon. It could be useful to have the the pictures of the uh, Clivus two more uh, in in the hologram that. Um, uh, get over the uh, the reality you see in the in the microscope and uh, tell you uh, how is going your surgery you have to remove all the tumor or you need still to uh, go uh, for example behind the uh, basilar vessel there is still tumor uh, so it could be um, useful if this technology could be uh, applied uh, to the operating microscope i think it could be in a just one word revolutionary for neurosurgery. I don't know if uh, your opinion, uh, Mr. Said and uh, Mr. Jason. I do um, think that would be incredible uh, if you could manage to somehow incorporate the augmented reality inside of the lens of the um, the microscope. I, I would have to look at, uh, at Mr. Evans here if that's uh, you know techno techno technologically possible. I do, however, have a, an additional idea that I also had was. Uh, you can have nowadays these little scanners that we would put on top of a, of, a, of a vein or something for nurses and it would show basically a superimposed image but it would show basically the veins of, mm. of the patient and then you can um, do much easier some functions but imagine for example as yeah. you're operating you can see the veins and the arteries much easier inside of the tumor because i've i've, I've been to operations before and i've seen the 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 how it looks through the um through the microscopic lens for me for the first or two or three times it's just a lot of pink and a lot of red right. so to distinguish things would be very hard yeah. but i think especially for an educational um purposes you can for example maybe in the future i'm not sure if that's possible now somehow be able to tint different parts of what you see for example tumor um cells more um, can be more green or more blue or something. So as you're operating, you'll be like, oh, mm -hmm. I, this is still more tumor, this is still that. Or you can see the arteries and the veins moving much better as it's superimposed through the microscope. I think that would make the success rate of um, tumor resections much higher. It would make it would make it go from 60 to 70% with when you're resecting. You don't have to leave things around because you're not sure if you're connected to a vessel or not. In this case, you can be more, more sure of what you're doing, I feel. Mm -hmm. Does uh, Peter has Peter used it in the OR? Uh, he did. He he used it more to 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 test it out actually, but he did use it to see scans beforehand, for example. Oh, okay. Before but he, okay. he usually does a lot of brain surgery, which requires a microscope, and he can't look with the glasses through the microscope. 
Okay, yeah. And to further add to the side's uh, point, um, you could integrate DICOM imaging data. Most um, processing data is under the format of DICOM and you can import that data quite easily into a mixed reality environment to reconstruct um, that DICOM imaging data as volumetric holographic models that you can interact with. In terms of uh, overlaying meshes to uh, patients, for example, um, you can do that and there's capability through the spatial mapping and spatial understanding of the device itself. Um, you get something known as spatial anchors and those spatial anchors uh, retain kind of a memory of where that hologram was overlaid in at the physical environment. Because one of the beautiful things about the HoloLens is that it actually has uh, multiple combinations of technology into its processing unit. Um, it has the same technology that the Kinect uh, sensors were uh, created for the Xbox, if you recall, the video game system. And what those sensors do is it creates a realistic understanding of the physical environment by mapping the coordinates of all objects on the X, Y, Z uh, coordinate system. And then from there, the holographic objects are overlaid on top of those mesh. So it actually retains a memory. The only thing that we've found so far is that there's a little bit of drift of the holograms. So you will get a bit of deviation in terms of the mesh being overlaid on top of the physical object. It can drift from time to time. But with the HoloLens version two, it actually has an artificial intelligence chip that's been built into its holographic processing unit. And it's capable of conducting uh, deep learning, um, which is a subset of machine learning directly right onto its device. So it has a much greater understanding now of the world. To answer your next point about having the filters for the different colors to be overlaid within the environment and to have uh, uh, objects such as tumors being outlined, absolutely, yeah, that comes back to the spatial understanding and then just being able to uh, test with different uh, filters, color filters applied to your, um, to your computer vision product. That sounds pretty cool, actually. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, it's super cool once you experience it. First time I experienced the HoloLens, it it just felt completely as if so this real, was, huh? Yeah, it was just it was so immersive, and that's that's one of the um, things that Microsoft advocates about this product is that you have to create compelling, immersive end user experiences, or else people won't be interested. Obviously, right. it would be novelty. Yeah. That's about it. That yeah. would be a gimmick, and that was the when I first had the, the device in my hand. I thought, oh, okay, I can see a little dog on the table, and I can walk around it and it looks cute. But how exactly is this going to help me operate better? And after a while, I did. I think um, I managed to to make it recognize a, a card that I had in my hand, and then when I would turn it around, it would do a, a little effect. And I was thinking, hmm, if it can recognize a card and it would do an effect on a motion, I would do. It could probably also, because I, I can't program at all, but I, I'm, that's why I'm looking at Mr. Evans here. If it's more possible, for example, to put, you can actually look, you can actually have x-ray vision. Please. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, well, it's it's more or less, you, you could if you, if you have like um, a, a source of imaging data that's mapped specifically to that patient yeah. or that end user, and then it's overlaid on top of the physical object as a mesh overlay. And then, yeah, uh, getting back to your point, you, you mentioned about um, putting meshes over top of uh, uh, like uh, joints such as like a hand, for example, and how the object would be stationary, but to see it, you would actually need some type of like movement, like flexing and extension. Um, yeah, it's, that, that's interesting. These are kind of like the, the use cases that you'll stumble across where you haven't thought about how to solve something like this in the past. Yeah. So, yeah, um, but I think with the advent of machine learning built into the product, a lot of these scenarios are going to be automatically taken care of in the future. Yeah, um, I do agree with that, especially because, for example, I was thinking if you are going to map something, you might as well use um, real world markers, for example. Uh, when 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 people do CGI, um, rec you know, CGI filming of faces, for example, they do they place a lot of 
little black dot on the face. So that when the patient, the person uses different facial markers, the camera would notice that and then, you know, transform that into whatever you want it to be. Um, you could do that with a hand as well. You can put specific dots on the hand, be like, this is a digit, this is a digit, this is the hand phalanx, whatever, and then connect that with the scan. And as the hand is moving, the scan would also move. But the animations of it and all of the little intricacies, that that is a lot more than, that, that, that's a lot more thinking required that, that I'm not really educated to know about. <laughs> Yeah, like, uh, it's interesting because, um, yeah, like the Azure Connect, like this right here is like the Connect version one sensor. I don't know if you can see whoa, it. Whoa, yeah, yeah, so this basically will... Is that a good set? Uh, well, it? this is old technology. Oh, along with one of the first ones? Yeah, exactly. And um, it wasn't until just recently that Microsoft released their Azure Connect um, sensor. And how I could describe it is it's like a, a, a webcam on steroids because it'll like completely 3D map the environment now with depth. And uh, from what I saw of the device, it'll map out like if you're in like a, an auditorium, the device has the ability to have um, the depth of like up to 12 rows in a, in a theater. So that's how much kind of depth sensing capability it has now. So it does very effective um, 3D mapping and then projection over Microsoft's cloud services through Azure. And maybe to, to make it a bit more easier for, for the viewers to understand, like, um, you know, anybody know Snapchat, the app? And I, if it, a lot of the, a lot of the times nowadays, you have filters on this app that you could just look into the camera. The camera looks at your face. You say, "This is my face," and then it would put something on it, like it will make your eyes bigger or make you have a dog face or something like yeah. that. And it's a simple. I use that a lot. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And your phone can already do that. And this is just an application you can download from anywhere. It's just a phone. And I can only imagine in the future, especially with the newer phones coming out with actual death sensors dedicated depth sensors on the back of the camera to be able to take okay, this is a house table of chairs everything so you can do that with your phone i can only imagine with a device much bigger with bigger cameras how much more in depth that can be more specific yeah and that's a that's the nice thing about these devices like even with the version one here you have the capability to override the optics of the device and you could actually put this on top of uh, a digital SLR camera and get much higher resolution. And that's essentially like any of the demos you see that Microsoft conducts. Mm -hmm. um, those demos aren't actually, the mixed reality capture isn't done with like a, another uh, HoloLens device. It's done with like a, a souped up version of the HoloLens sitting on top of um, okay. a much, uh, yeah, more capable camera of higher uh, optics. So yeah, absolutely. There's definitely um, uh, many use cases. And that's, th that's one of the most attractive things about this technology is because it is building on uh, the universal Windows uh, platform framework that it the cross compatibility capability is it's just it's it's so there across like all the products it integrates so well uh, another i had a question actually you used the uh, you, you have used the mic um, the hololens too or no i haven't yet no but my uh the other um co-founder that i'm working with on the mixed 3d project um he's actually one of the uh uh uh, advocates within the communicate community so he's actually had the opportunity to use the device um i haven't had the opportunity yet i've been invited but just schedule hasn't worked out yeah so hopefully on this tuesday i'm i'm scheduled to go to microsoft so i'm hoping right. to get my hands on it you want to um, give a talk after that yeah absolutely <laughs> yeah, i'm sure you like to see that sorry Said. Yeah, I will definitely be wanting to hear about that because one question I had about the original, the first one was the the rather the rather small FO, the yeah FOV field of view you had of the device. So basically, it's not so. If I have my glasses right now, it's not so. What I see through my glasses is this entire square, right? And if I put it on my face, my entire face, my entire peripheral is what I see through the glasses. But however, if I look up enough, I can see above my glasses, and the, the hollow lenses. The, the glasses you see through is actually w much smaller than than your actual peripheral and i would so if i would stand a bit further away from my laptop it would be about that much i would see through it so if i had a really large scan i couldn't see the entire scan because the even though my face my my vision would see the room it's in the the device itself would look like this so the scan would only show 
I mean, the, the hologram would only show a bit half of it. So I was wondering if, if the field of view would be bigger on the whole lens too. That's uh, they, well. That's one of their uh, key features that they're that they're promoting right now is that it has increased. And one of the challenges that Microsoft worked with um, initially was the field of view constraints um, in respect to the cost of the device. Um, just the waveguides within the actual. Um, if you actually see, there's actually these waveguides. Um, I can't I'll see if I'll put it up. Yeah, and you see kind of how they look. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that would be like your field of view there, and apparently they're um, they have increased. It's like in the software when you're creating it, it's fully immersive, 360 degrees. Um, so eventually, as the hardware, um, the capability of the of the optics improves over time, and the price is brought down, then um, it, from a software point of view, that's not a problem. And that's where kind of like the immersive mixed reality devices um, stand out right now because. When Microsoft released Windows 10 uh, a couple years ago, one of their main goals was um, for Windows Mixed Reality. And in everyone's computer right now, you actually have the Windows Mixed Reality portal, which is available. If your uh, GPU within your laptop or your desktop um, can support the Windows Mixed Reality devices, then it easily plugs into your computer. And now you have a full 360 degree, they call it immersive mixed reality. It's kind of more like a VR experience, but the spatial mapping and spatial understanding of the environment is what kind of separates uh, virtual reality and augmented reality um, from the mixed reality is that the mixed reality devices understand the physical environments. That does sound a lot more like virtual reality, indeed, because I did work with the, yeah. with the Hololens and the and the Vive as well, and yeah. another Hololens, well, like Oculus Rift. And, uh, excuse me, Saeed. We have Ipe Terry in here. He's a noted neurosurgeon. Uh, he's done some work with uh, virtual reality. I know he has an interest in it. How you doing, Ipe? Ipe. Let me unmute you there. Go ahead, Ipe. Hi, John. Uh, good to see you. Just joined uh, the show. Let me listen to what he has to say. Well, uh, you missed the bulk of it, I. Uh, but that's that's okay. Uh, can you can you uh, this? Is, let me introduce you to Saeed Sen Senlai. Uh, he's a master student from uh, the Netherlands. Uh, and I was done. You've done some some work with virtual reality in the OR, correct? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay, can you tell Saeed what you've done and if you have any questions about it? Right, see, we have a, a three Tesla interoperative MR and we have mated that uh, to a, a Medtronic's navigation and then we have this uh, OAM. So what we do is uh, we fuse the OAM images to the MR images. And then uh, on the workstation, we make uh, a bone plus soft tissue uh, fused image. We use a software to fuse it. Sometimes we use manual fusion, and then we um, we navigate with that. And the microscope that I have has image injection, so um, I can uh, use that as well. Now, I'm very interested in uh, this Oculus Rift and uh, also we are working on a new microscope uh, where we have a virtual vision interposed with uh, the, the real vision. So we are working on how to uh, fuse the real vision with, uh, with, uh, the, with the virtual vision. So with, uh, uh, for especially skull base. So brain, uh, it is a bit difficult because of the brain shift and all that. But skull base, we think it's a rather easy option. For example, carotid, the vessels, the cranial nerves, they don't shift. So we're trying to fuse it. And maybe the next step would be real time because we have the intraop MRI. So real time wouldn't be much difficult. So this is my interest. Yeah, we were talking mostly about Microsoft uh, HoloLens, mostly. Uh, uh -huh. you, 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 do you use that in the OR2 uh, IPE? Have you used that or no? no. O Oculus, Oculus we, only. We, yeah, so we have, in Alicante, we use the Oculus, but I'm very interested in the Microsoft HoloLens too. So um, 
this if we could use uh, because the new microscope we're looking at uh, is uh, for 3d vision but then uh, with microsoft hololens i can fuse both the real images and the virtual images i mean we are uh, seriously considering uh, some alteration some uh, customization for this microsoft hololens to use it along with the calstos white on 3d yeah, let me introduce you to Jason Evans. He He's going to use the Microsoft HoloLens 2 next week. Uh, so he'll he'll have uh, the latest word on what's going on. Right, Jason? Yeah, absolutely. So um, a nice yeah, to meet you. He's a big neurosurgeon uh, from uh, Nepal, originally India, but he, he's very tech smart and he's pushing the boundaries of, of tech. Uh, virtual reality and, and the OR and et cetera. So I'm sure he'll be interested on, on what you find after you're trying the Microsoft HoloLens 2 next week. He's, he's going, he's trying it. I, I guess it's brand new. Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a second development generation. This is version one uh, development device uh, that you're familiar with. It's been available since probably 2016, March, 2016. So version two of the device is expected to be released. The target date is uh, June 2019, and it's more geared towards the enterprise now, less geared towards um, development community. It's not quite considered yet a consumer product. So there's still, you consider it an R&D kind of mode. Um, but right now it would be perfect opportunity for um, uh, use cases, uh, especially within operating rooms, because um, it's such a new technology and the capability of the, uh, of the code framework is built on the universal Windows platform. So it integrates across that entire ecosystem of products uh, throughout even all like Office 365. So you could be in the operating room. You could have um, a, a dashboard uh, on the device that's available. Um, from what I'm hearing from Syed, um, uh, it seems as if, yeah, that's something that uh, his research uh, valued was having diagnostic data pulled in from multiple device units. You could have DICOM imaging data overlays through image viewers. You could even have your Outlook uh, calendar uh, pinned up on a wall that you could easily check with. Um, it's, it's, yeah, it, it really, the, it, the, the challenge would be um, figuring out kind of the ergonomic design factors to really nail it down. Because that's what I found was kind of like um, the biggest constraint at the start of getting involved with this technology was trying to figure out what's the best practices now within a, in a physical world where you're now the physical world is your entire kind of software code landscape. And you're trying to figure out things like I created a social holographic remote uh, collaboration tool called Mix3D with another co-founder. And like, for instance, we found that when some users would connect from larger living spaces, like there was one user that was in a large office location. And then there were some people that were in small um, offices. And what we found was all of a sudden, like the person in the large living space would walk like 20 feet through your, 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 wall in the in the smaller office so you have to kind of figure out now okay uh how do you manage with with that and what's the best way to deal with it is it some type of animation that gets triggered that'll all of a sudden cue the person to like reorientate themselves to the positioning of other people in the room or is it best to use like visual indicators to pull those people back to a landscape some of the things that we found work best with um, large use with a large group of users in in rooms was if we had a central object that we could place in the middle of the scene that would get all the end users to kind of form a circle around this object, and then that way it would kind of cue everyone to kind of line up appropriately. And what we found with our testing was that. We had 37 users simultaneously connect in the environment uh, at the same time. And we found that uh, we triggered uh, 37,000 view counts um, across uh, a test time of 30 minutes. Um, while each person was engaged with other holographic objects, uh, AKA themselves, they were talking to each other for four and a half minutes on average. 
And in reality, you know, that could be just someone standing in their office talking to the wall. <laughs> so, you know, so it's kind of, it's, it's very compelling because all of a sudden, you know, that person isn't actually in your physical room location, but you're so memorized by it that it seems like they're actually right there in front of you. You can pull up like, yeah, say you have 3D object models that you want to share. Hey, look at this new piece of equipment. Oh, look at this. You can share all those objects just as easily as you could sending a file through this Zoom webinar chat. Another option mm -hmm. I was thinking about when you were describing the, the 3D meeting is actually, for example, if, um, if you're on shift at night and the specialist is on call, for example, they, and then you have a resident doing a, a, a small operation or whatever, and he has a question or he or she has a question, you can actually just pop up the HoloLens and join the virtual operation as it were, with, with cameras and so that the, the specialist can then see what the resident is seeing and then help in that way yeah oh, i think you know. it, oh, sorry, yeah I, I think it could be also used uh, by distance for example if i have a, a bad pathology i'm not expert of skull base i could uh, for example ask the help of hype uh, from distance uh, he with uh, uh, holographic uh, virtual reality uh, can take guide me to the pathology, right? Yes, yes, for sure. Now, uh, my interest in this would be, I am uh, trying to use this as a 3D glass for my uh, white tone 3D. And then on that, I would like to superimpose the scans, uh, the virtual image of the super superimposed scans so that I know where exactly I'm drilling. I know where the carotid is. Not that I don't know about it, but it would make me much more confident. So, um, for example, if I'm doing a petrosectomy or if I'm doing a trans lab, if I know where is the IAM when I'm drilling, um, I mean, or where the jugular bulb is, uh, or if I'm going transapical superiorly, transapical inferiorly, so where is the cochlear aqueduct? These are some things that you, you always don't know. So, these are things where if you have uh, if you can superimpose the whole scans on the white tone 3D images, these are some things that you could do. And as Marco said, of course, you can step into somebody's theater and then, uh, you know, help or take help from Marco. So this is, uh, these are things which you could do. That this is, the, this is really future. And by the way, tomorrow we are doing, a, uh, on Super Sunday, we are doing a paraclinoid aneurysm where we have done the complete dolling approach and then there was an inter interoperative brief rupture which actually helped me to clip it so we will be doing uh, this one and we'll be doing t this tomorrow on super sunday okay we were just talking actually about the possibilities of uh, superimposing images pre uh, intraoperatively for example we were talking about the pos because right nowadays you have the the scans that you can see ven uh, venous and arteries and that, that's just proposed on skin so nurses can know exactly where, where they can do their punctures. And we're thinking how that would, for example, in the microscope, that would be very nice because you can then use your augmented, because then this, this still counts as augmented reality as you would then project arteries and veins in the microscope on your operation area. So what you're seeing, and then you can clearly see, okay, this is where that vein is, this is where that artery looks. So you can more or less navigate yourself much more nicely instead of trying to figure it out just by seeing and guessing. Yeah, I, I feel there's gonna be several form factors of this technology available. I feel that um, I see a lot of um, research and development going on with the optic companies for microscopy and getting augmented reality overlays built into their products, including with machine learning and uh, deep learning through computer vision, which really helps with um, uh, uh, identifying specific markers within the images that it sees and it does it with much greater um, uh, time and with um, much uh, fewer defects along the way in terms of identifying those markers. Um, other use cases of hardware that I saw from other investment firms was more on an enterprise level. They have like studio kind of theaters where they're um, like glass screens that are set up in the room and then you get the complete kind of, uh, kind of like the Tupac walking on the stage um, hologram that you saw a few years ago. Um, 
that's starting to be used in like concerts and entertainment venues. I'm starting to see those type of solutions now available for enterprise units where it's just like a looking glass where it's a large kind of theater display and then it has that same kind of uh, remote um, holographic presence to it. Um, that's quite useful um, for large audiences, I find. So. I think I'll get a Microsoft HoloLens as soon as it's available. <laughs> yeah, it's it's very um it's captivating technology. <laughs> I would like to connect to the R and D team who's working on this. Who can uh, you know if I can connect to somebody in the R and D, uh, and you know and then it's tell them what the developer, I developer, right? Yeah, the developer. Yeah. Uh, the so that we could. Uh, tell them that uh, you know we are working for a new microscope because the present microscope is just uh, i mean it's so outdated um, because the chipoli camera is going to come i mean going to be there there is there will be no more optics so an 8k camera with 3d facilities which can increase the depth you know the stereo depth uh, in a camera in a optic camera cannot be changed but in a in a uh, in a chipoli camera this can be manipulated so you can get uh, more depth when you're magnifying more the depth actually decreases in a optical camera but the depth can uh, you know can be uh, kept the same or even you can have a increased depth uh, when you're going on higher and higher mag in a, um, in a digital camera all this can be done i mean this is uh, this is something that the surgeons need to use. I mean, uh, and if you can use this, skull base and vascular becomes much more easier. And if you can combine the surgical skills, the experience and this, then you can have much better results. So, I mean, this is what the world is coming to right now. And so we have to use all this. Uh, do, you, do you foresee mentoring uh, other neurosurgeons how to do cystinostomy through virtual, through, through, through these means, right? I uh, in fact, uh, two weeks before I was in Malaysia and I was heading a, um, I was heading a course there. And uh, what I did is I did the first day I used the white home 3D uh, mm -hmm. for the sections. I did a Dolings, my version of the Dolings and uh, the petrosectomy. I combined both these um, and then I did this on a white home so that everybody could see this in 3D. And uh, we are now starting to operate with the VTOM on a Mitaka uh, arm um, so that we are trying to replace the microscope completely. And I'm trying to get these uh, images, the, the navigated images onto the VTOM. So we're working with car stores on that. With these kind of things, uh, we can easily teach surgeons in 3D, not like uh, the 2D. I mean, well, I have the 3D Trinion. Um, uh, I mean, images in my theater, in my, in my OR, I have the Trinion monitor and uh, the Penchero microscope with the 3D facilities. So, but then um, better than that, I feel now the Trinion is very costly, but uh, a VTOM will be an excellent solution uh, if it can be used like a microscope. Be, it is a Chipoli camera. And if it can be used just like the white term, and uh, let's let's say that no screen, just uh, Microsoft HoloLens too. So you can look wherever you want and you can operate. And you can sit wherever you want and you can operate. You know, this is my dream. So we now I'm looking at the screen and uh, taking off the microscope, but the next step would be no screens. Okay. Okay. Yeah, in terms of holography, they've been... Uh... They've been doing, they have several other uh, ways to project mm -hmm. holograms into a physical environment. Mm -hmm. And um, some of the methods, uh, John, if you recall the last time we had uh, spoke um, with the other uh, gentleman that was on the call, um, he was describing uh, his experience where lasers were used to ionize metals and then light would be projected. And you have these objects that would come up um, since then i've seen solutions where they'll use like led lights and then they'll create like um just good for marketing purposes and billboards like where you can have what looks like it's like an illusion of a hologram that's kind of being projected um but the, those two solutions you can't really inject any software code into them so you don't really get any type of user interaction with those type of holograms and 
Uh, and yeah, they can be, that this is where the head mounted device kind of uh, software capability <laughs> comes into play because you can start bringing these objects to life quite easily. Like the input system for the HoloLens, you have three mm -hmm. forms of input. Where you look, it's like kind of similar to like moving your mouse around on your computer. Where you tap, like an air tap on this device, it's uh, that's like a mouse click. Uh, the HoloLens 2, the gesture capability is going to be um, much more open now. Instead of, be, instead of being restricted to just like an air tap, which it's called, like a mouse click, like making an L, you're going to have much more capability where you can just like swat holograms out of the way, push on objects. And, and, and the HoloLens 2, the AI chip that's built into the holographic processing unit, the HPU, it tracks all the bones within your hands. So it has an understanding constantly of like what all the joints are doing as well. So that's one of the improvements for the next version. And then the third input that it uses is voice. But what they're finding is voice isn't as widely used. And there's some kind of constraints around voice commands, such as you have to use uh, labeled text that's quite easily to remember. Um, I've seen some apps out there where the voice library is like so complex and you have no idea of remembering what's built inside its kind of voice dictionary. So I don't feel that's very good effective design. So what I what Microsoft recommends is to have the labels and text on your holographic objects that are exactly similar to your voice input. So if it's like select, you just say select and it'll select the, the, uh, the button as if you're clicking your mouse on a, on a button on a 2D laptop screen. So yeah, so once those design constraints are kind of figured out, then um, I think this technology is it's, it's here to stay. It's going to revolutionize. Um, it's the it's next wave of, of computing products. Definitely. As the ergonomics improve and the design factors improve a device, that's where um, as soon as it's as easy as putting on just a pair of glasses, uh, that's probably once this technology is going to go mainstream. Yeah, we already saw that with some of the more consumer augmented reality glasses for, yeah, for, like I said, extensions of your phones and things like that. Yeah, like the one you're using, that seems very interesting for like a daily product. Which uh, what which uh, glasses were those that you? These are these are just normal glasses. They're not. They're not. Oh no, not those <laughs> ones. But I mean, like your um the ones that you showed in your presentation earlier. Um, you had oh. a couple of different uh, yeah. brands. I I've seen oh, uh actually I've seen um uh Boss. They released um a pair of augmented reality glasses yeah, that they, they look really slick. Yeah, the ones I had on my presentation were the well, the in my opinion, the more the, the ones that look like sunglasses were the GoGlu E6. Those are more like smart glasses that can take pictures and record video and stuff like that, and they can project the video as well while you're while you're doing your daily stuff. But the Vuzix Blade is a more comfortable. That that one really looks like sunglasses, maybe a little bit more like a like a one of those cinema theater 3D glasses. But it comes in a different for, um, variety of colors, and what's very cool is specifically for someone like me that you can actually get in prescription glasses as well so you can just get normal prescription glasses and then it, it's a smart glass as well and it's this one the the other three were about 200 dollars um or less like the few um the google was around 150 and the view fine which is just this little thing that connects to your glasses actually around 50 dollars if i'm not wrong on amazon big big decrease yeah but the but like I said, these are more just cameras, and then they can put the picture in front of your 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 vision. So it's not really real time. It's more of a like I said, an extension of your phone. But the one I was talking about, the one that really looks pretty, is around more or less more or less like eight hundred to a thousand dollars for a the supreme special edition that has a micro SD slot and more things like that. And that one you can get in prescription glasses, which is very nice. That's very cool. Yeah, uh, you triggered a thought while while you're speaking. Um, so with the Hololens too, that's another feature is that it actually does eye tracking now. So it'll it'll maps where the user is actually looking, and then it'll reposition the holograms as that person is looking based on eye movement. And I found an interesting question that a developer in the community had asked during the presentation was they asked if 
essentially you if you, you could have open access to that eye tracking data because they're like if so you could probably start measuring things like um different emotional responses that that end user may be experiencing mm -hmm. and you start measuring like eye muscle contraction and i just felt that was a very interesting um opportunity and a use case uh thinking about just decoding that data now that it's available yeah i was actually that was one of the things i was thinking about it with with um with dr kuban in the beginning of my research uh, internship like what 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 can we do because um for example I, I i like playing video games and i love playing video games since i was very young and i play a lot of different consoles and also follow technology pretty actively on, on, on all types of social media and i read magazines and articles and all that so he was asking me what 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 would you do with something that you don't normally use in medicine and how can you use medicine and my my, my idea came up to use augmented reality but since then actually there have been so many different um other things that came out um specifically in smartphones that you can use in medicine for example the new lg uh, i think it's the g, the g the new lg phone it has instead of just you know a camera recognition of your face or a fingerprint reader it has this new form of security where it measures the hemoglobin count and the and the vein um patterns of your palm so you just put your palm in front of the phone and it recognizes that and then it unlocks the phone and for in, in the beginning, it does sound exactly like it is. It's just a gimmick because it is still easier to just use your finger to open the phone. But this opens up a lot of different possibilities. For example, you can use that technology but because there's a hemoglobin scanner it, you could, on, on a phone, something small that you could just buy anywhere for, about, I think it's like $800 or less. And you can use that to measure and actually see vein counts and measure hemoglobin without having to puncture anything. It would be very nice for people that have chronic diseases or anemia or whatever to check their hemoglobin just by using their phones. Yeah, in the rural countries. ECGs. Yeah, for example. Or you have ECGs you can connect to the back of your phone and you can just put your fingers on it and it measures, measures your entire um, your thing. So I do think technology is going in a, in a very, in, in a lot of different ways, but um, the, the applications in medicine is is like a one step extra that that is very interesting. For example, the Connect was mainly made for games and the hololens was mainly made for for traversing um well this windows landscape but then in a different step but then using this in medicine i thought that was but that was the extra step because you can just think about oh i can also use this in an operating room by seeing something through my microscope or seeing scans or whatever so it's used in plastic surgery you mentioned any other areas of medicine you've seen it used in in maastricht I haven't seen it used yet in, in other um, things. Oh, specialties, but you you think it will happen in the surgical. I, I definitely specialty. think it will happen, especially in things like orthopedics, for example, where CT scans and x-rays are pretty, pretty important, pretty major. Yeah, Yeah, I'll send you a webcast we did with a spine surgeon from Brazil uh, that mm -hmm. uses it mostly for superpositions. Yeah, of, exactly. Of possible graphs to, to measure the size of a graft he was using it. Yeah, in Maastricht, I know they did a research on uh, the use of Oculus Rift, for example, and um, in transformative surgery, for example, in I don't know some sort of augmentation of, of, of for example, in breast implants, for example. Um, you can always just put the picture on your computer, and then the patient would be like, "Oh, that's how I'm going to look like after the operation." Um, but it's much better if they were were wearing. In this case, they were using the Oculus wear the oculus and then just look down and be like oh that's how i'm gonna look like after the operation it gives it gives basically it just gives another dimension to what you're seeing which is most importantly i find for patients to understand what they're getting into fascinating okay very good um thank you for taking the time Said, excellent presentation and, and good discussion uh we look forward hopefully to having future ones to continue on with what, uh, what's going on with, with virtual reality and augmented reality in the OR. So, and I hope, I hope Jason can let us know how his first session with Holo, uh, Microsoft HoloLens 2 goes. I'm sure Ipe, Ipe will be interested in hearing that. Um, yeah, thank you very much for, for having me on the, on the show. It was very nice. Yeah, th um, yeah it'll be we're gonna send it to you. We'll send you the tape copy. Thanks. And, uh, um, and if anything, I will keep on probably looking into the uses of 
multiple types of technology in neurosurgery because that is a very big interest. Yeah, and anything you want to televise on neurosurgical TV, you're welcome. Just let me know. Yes. Sir. Any any parting questions or comments, Marco? Before uh, we go. No, simply thank you. Thank you say, okay. Jason. Uh, it was very, very interesting, very impressive. <laughs> thank you. Hey, John, you're like me. You're very quiet. That's okay. Thank you for coming. Yeah, it's my pleasure. Thank you. Um, thank you. Yeah. Well, anything to say or just hello? <laughs> That's um, okay, John. That's, you don't have to say anything. Yeah, okay, yeah. No Saeed, thank you very much, and uh, we look forward to future presentations.